Welcome back, everyone, to Tia Know the Last Days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokalov, and right now, we are looking at the all-Russian government of the Far East. I've already gone ahead and basically reunited the Far Eastern here, and this is the new government we have. I did off-screen just because we can get into more research slot, and I kind of sped things up a little bit more. But we're doing fresh off the boat currently. Three crates of assault rifles, two crates of grenades. Where do that shipment of artillery shells go? They need that at the front now. Ever since the recovery of Magadan from Matkovsky's splitters, shipments of arms and supplies from the sphere into the port city have become increasingly regular. Japanese guns and grenades have been streaming into the port city and then distributed westwards, where the RFP's forces need them the most. At times, these shipments have become so frequent that the dock workers at Magadan joke that there are more guns than men in Rodzeski's Russia. This isn't entirely inaccurate. Ever since Rodzeski's first foray back into Russia following the collapse of the Bolsheviks, he has relied heavily on the material and support of Japan and her allies. Why stop now? Commando units are not bad. March lessons? I want to save that one for last, so... Commando units. Rozeski and his top generals have convened in their state's capital of Zaya to discuss the formation of commando units. These units would be responsible for highly asymmetric warfare, including the destruction of infrastructure, such as railroads, the demoralization of enemies' war efforts via raid raids on villages and garrisons, and the procurement of supplies through less than savory methods. These commando units, known as the Nacionalia Spetsolizba, or the NSPETS, will be deployed behind enemy lines through our porous Siberian borders to wreak havoc and disrupt our enemy's ability to resist our unstoppable forces. That's not to say that our frontline troops would be unable to defeat our foes, of course, but that, at that moment, every soldier's life is precious and the entire command all the way up to the boss himself are in agreement that we must take action to prevent as many frontline casualties as possible, which is very true. So, after we've taken a break from the last video, and I've calmed down a little bit after saying that no one should play a mirror, or very little, very few people should play a mirror just because it's this is very difficult. <laughs> Amur is not easy. It's, as you saw from yesterday, it's not easy. It's possible to win, as I've shown, but it is it is just mm, not easy. But I've also gone ahead and spent a lot of political power, which we basically have none. We're integrating Yakutia, Northern Siberia, Ch Chukotka, Kamchatka, as well as doing a lot of regional developments here. So, that's very good. Just because now, society is improving everywhere. Rozeski's plan is working. And agriculture is looking very nice, except for poverty. It's kind of stagnant, but that's all right. And let's go ahead. Uh, actually, do we want to finish this off? Uh, we can wait. We can wait to do these because we'll probably get some sort of blueprints for them. So, uh, land auction is pretty good already. Industry really needs to get looked at, though. It's really just not very good right now. Let's grab some more output because we definitely need some more output because we need more artillery. We're actually good on guns now, finally. More dual secure leadership. That's fine. So, we have six divisions. And we have... We started... Okay, so when we united all of this part of the Far East. We had like 150,000 manpower, but now we have 100,000 since I'm trying to make more divisions here too. And eventually, we will try to get some 40 combo with divisions as well. But we have no equipment, or very little equipment. March. Lessons from the Ice March. The Great Siberian Ice March was a devastating blow to the White Russian movement and virtually ended the Russian Civil War for Kolchak and his successors. Not only did it decimate the state's standing army, but it also caused a temporary collapse of our authority and allowed traitors a chance to split the party. While it has been a long time since the Ice March, its memories and consequences are still fresh in Rodzewski's mind, however. The event was not without its lessons. The necessity of advanced secure logistics, the importance of winterizing equipment, and the acclimatization of our troops to the harsh Siberian winters are all key elements ensuring that there will never be another Ice March. The fire of the Russian spirit burns brighter than even the coldest Siberian wind. Very good, because I want to wait, and we can use this stuff definitely when we fight Tomsk in within three years, so. Um, uh, also, someone also said... Like, from, actually, a few guys, a few of you guys said from the video yesterday, or the last video, that I should have put a kitten over the swastika uh, on the thumbnail just because Rozeski has his little mirror. So, that would have been really cool. Actually, I probably should have done that. But oh well. Aim to ye vengeful. Aim to ye vengeful and shoot for the hot. Look upon what we've accomplished, ye mighty, and rejoice. For we've turned the tide of anarchy and Bolshevism back and have taken the first steps to establishing a true Russian state. With a multitude of successes over our enemies, be them Bolsheviks, breakaway states, or traitors or renegades, the morale of our long-suffering armies begin to improve. For the first time in a long time, songs can be heard both at the factory and the barracks. Even the administration, the army of the bureaucrats, political officers, and ministers seem to go about their work cheerfully. The rapid and near-total success of the Vaz forces have done loads for our state's morale, and is beginning to show. We must build upon this momentum and prepare for future expansion. Yes, we will, and the Far Eastern Front. 
With our party united, the false Tsar and the renegade dealt with, and the Yakuts reintegrated into our state, we can begin looking at taking the rest of our Far East for ourselves and preparing for the ultimate march west. In that direction, Soviet rum states dominate the political landscape, and their highly disciplined armies are well equipped to pose a serious threat to our bid for Russian reunification. That being said, the morale of the troops is at record high, and the shipments of arms and ammo from the Japanese benefactors is slowly being matched by our own industrial production. It won't be an easy task, but the Vaz men are definitely up to it. Do not stray from the path of strength. Persevere, even in the face of extreme adversity. This is the true Russian spirit that has been softened by the Bolsheviks. Our resilience will set us apart. If you'd like to read about better industrial equipment, please go ahead. Exit, so we have power tools, now with the rudimentary manufacturing lines, more output, construction speed, and resource efficiency gain. Sign us up. And this will give you plus 5% more division speed. That's not bad. Out of supply, okay. Not bad, not bad. And then we'll get to the actual next part of the focus tree, which will be very, very cool. Very, very nice. And, yes, yeah, civilian construction. Build, 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 build. My goodness. Even build more, because right now we are at, what, seven? Six? That's so bad. We are definitely the absolute underdogs here. And I'm not going to cut military spending, because we need as much output as possible right now. Like, we don't have enough artillery. So I refuse to cut things down, because we're going to need pretty much every piece of equipment here. Actually, I might boost it up, actually. We will do that when we go to war with these guys, but... Oh, second South African war? Nice. We've had one South African war. How about a second one? And also, we have a deficit already, so... Not bad. I like it a lot. I love it. And now we're points of four. That's actually not too bad. Oh, precision. If you want to read about this, please go right ahead. If you like to read about subdued peasants, please go right ahead as well. As well as denounce the father. Huh. So this stuff was all supposed to happen. Um, but obviously they went to war with us, and then we killed them off. So we got through a lot of this very quickly, which is nice. Of course, it is already almost 1966. Cool. And all that glitters. Oh, that looks so good. The Red Menace. Why we fight? Hang the heretic. Oh. Oh, do we still have that? Oh. Do we still have the stuff here? The stuff. Oh, we have... Oh, I don't like that. Overextended administration. The little debuffs from man, from the Divine Mandate, hurting us. Oh, it doesn't look like it. Doesn't look like it. No. Let's go and do this one. All the glitters. The saying that all that glitters is not gold, but saying that saying certainly doesn't ring true in the territory that we took from the state of Aldan. Even before our conquest, the region was dotted with gold mines, with workers mining away precious bits of gold to help support Aldan's partisan rabble. Our economic ministry, however, is disappointed with our lackluster reports of productivity in these mines. By now, our approach to forced labor for precious metals is one of our best practice policies. Why would we stop using prisoners of war to locals and locals to slave away in our mines now? The gold here is well worth their sacrifice. Absolutely. Marching on, right? That's why you have got to be careful, Pavel, explained Dimitri, dropping his cigarette to grind it underfoot. The guys out west? Sure, they're reds, and that makes them weak-minded, but there's a lot of them. You see, the reds are like, hmm. He tapped his foot for a moment trying to think of the right analogy. Like rats, sir, Pavel suggested? Dimitri nodded emphatically. Right, Private, like rats. You catch one by himself, you can squish him in no problem. Choke him out, stick him with your bayonet, b blow his head off, whatever, but if there's five or ten or fifty, they'll just overrun you, kill you with lots of little bites. Probably torture you first, though. <clears throat> Pavel went pale. The teenager's eyes dilated in the orange glow of the brazier. To torture me? Oh yeah, said Dimitri as he lit up another cigarette and took a puff. He paused for a moment to recall. There was this one time, and not long after we came here from Habim. We were still probing the frontier at the time, try still trying to figure out where to set up the border post. Well, some NKVD boys from Irkutsk must have gotten wind of us coming. While I was taking a pee, they grabbed my pal, my pal, Simeon. Found him tied to a tree with his privates cut off and shoved in his mouth. I looked around, but they effed off already. Darn, sir, Pavel mumbled, are they all like that? Bad word, yes they are. That's why we gotta hit them back as hard as they do. When I tell you, slit that kid's throat, you do it straight away next time. You hear me? How else will they learn? How else? He's got to learn that it's doggy doggy world out here. Oh. This is even a kutsk and stuff like this. Alright, so a lot of this is just gonna auto bypass, so... Uh, I don't know if we can... If this is all going to bypass, but whatever. We must seize upon them, each of us, with the strength of ten men to ensure our victory. The Bolsheviks may be soft in spirit and practice, but they have many bodies, indoctrinated soldiers who serve them like lapdogs. Stay true to our cause and never waver, my men. Only then we will achieve victory. The communists of the West are the natural next step in our journey towards Russian reunification. They are just now recovering from an inter... inter internecine conflict, as now that we should strike. Otherwise, the Vaz fears that a Soviet state allowed to recover will cause a serious barrier towards our desire for a united fascist Russia. We can even deploy the NSPETs and test their effectiveness for the first time. Outwards, brave soldiers, and do not stop until Irkutsk. Nice. Wow, we really don't have a lot of manpower. But we've made four more divisions. We made four whole more divisions. Nice. Go and train. Too many combat wits are going to have to do what we got. 
do with whatever we got to do with them. So I'm going to go do it, hang the heretic. Our triumph over the mad preacher, in hindsight, was inevitable. The rabble that he had rallied to his cause was trampled under the well-disciplined boots of the Vaz loyal soldiers. When he finally caught men and a small group of dedicated bodyguards attempting to flee westwards towards the rest of Russia, only a brief and rather pathetic degree of resistance was put forward. Now we parade the, the priests through our capital and can begin preparing the trial of Alexander Mem. The priest has remained silent throughout his capture, perhaps out of cowardice or a misplaced uh, sense of stoicism, but a pair of both secular and religious trials, each carrying the penalty of death by hanging, will ensure that men's fate is sealed. A highly public trial will ensure the humiliation of the heretical priest, and his execution will surely quash the remnants of his movement. I would love if we could peacefully unite with um, Tomsk, but I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen. Very good. If you like to read about that, please go ahead. And against Ideals as well. Nice. Hang the heretic. Well, he deserves it. Why we fight? Listen up, everyone, shouted the RFP officer as he strode into the grotty bar in Zaya. The boss is about to speak. Bartender, switch that radio on. The bartender, who had paled to the sight of a black shirt appearing in his establishment, hastened to flick the switch and turn the tuner to the correct frequency. After a brief delay, drawing a suspicious look from the black shirt, the Vaz voice began to fill the dark, dingy tavern. Why we must strike them down regardless of blood ties. Remember that while the Jew poisons the blood, the communist corrupts the soul. There's no redemption in this life for a Bolshevik, even if they are a friend or a family member. The only thing that you can do for the wretched souls is to hasten their journey to heck, where they might find some spiritual redemption by allowing them to continue living amongst us. You only darn more of your own Russian brothers and sisters. Every Bolshevik spared will turn countless children to worship the Red Judas Lenin and turn your wives and daughters into whores for the Jewish pigs. Remember this lesson and do your duty to God and your race. Glory to Russia. The radio fell into a crackling static for a moment before someone in a broadcast station flicked a switch and started up the usual patriotic music. The boss had spoken, Citizens, bellowed the black shirt, Glory to Russia. He threw a salute, glanced around to make sure everyone else had followed suit, and departed without a word more. We're doing our part, right? Right, everyone? Right? Yes, we are. Try the Presidium? Uh, uncover the industry, yes. Only one for one city, my goodness. Many things have been made clear by our invasion of the land controlled by Soblin and his supporters. More than anything, however, the one most glaring obvious thing that has been revealed to us was the massive amount of industry that was hidden in Berati and beyond. Luckily, Soblin's men and women either lack the heart, the head, or the orders to destroy these vast industrial sectors as their forces advanced upon them. <clears throat> It is imperative that we repurpose these factories for our own uses, having them churn out weapons and ammo day and night, staffing them with our own loyalists, and packing them with volunteers if we're unable to fill them normally. The boss is confident that, we'll be, that we will find plenty of these volunteers from the recently defeated Soviet troops, like we did with the Yakuts and the mines. Work for your freedom, work for your penance, work for Russia. And we will read the heresy very, very soon. Nice. The crowd, which had been assembled to witness the execution of Alexander Men, was uncomfortably silent. Nobody said a word or threw anything as they parted to let the black shirts through, their priestly prisoner in tow. Men, haggard, starved, broken, but unbowed. He continued to quietly pray through bloodied lips, pacing along the calmly as a monk going about his cloistered life. Only at the far fringes of the crowd were voices heard, heard voices that whispered of the northern priest that had taken on a reputation that far eclipsed his humble form. Some spoke of his plain appearance, others of his supposed sorcerer's powers. All were tinged by fear of what might come as a consequence of his demise. Even the patriarch, avid follower of the church of the, and the boss, conducted the last rites with trembling hands. The black shirts, standing alongside the condemned, glanced nervously and tapped their feet, wishing only for the sense of discomfort, of wrongness to end. Men's quiet prayers wormed their way into ears of those around him. There was no acknowledgment of the news being fastened around his neck. The lever clunked. Men's body dropped, ending his prayers instantly with a near inaudible crunch. Bolotov, who had specifically tied the noose to strangle the priest to death instead, turned white as snow as he realized what had happened. They all knew the truth in the depths of their souls. A terrible thing had been done, but none would ever speak of it again. The citizens that present that day would forever live in silent fear of the judgment now that surely awaited them. Man is unjust, but God is just, and finally justice triumphs. <coughs> Very good. Things must be done. And then, trial the Presidium. The capture of the city of Irkutsk also meant the capture of Yagoda and a so-called Presidium, the rump state of the Union, so Union of Soviet Socialist, Socialist Republics. With their defeat, the last legitimate contender to the USSR can truly be declared ahead and dead. Our boss has dreamed of this day and is already prepared for the fate of the Presidium and their leader. A show trial in the city of Rodzevsk that will be highly publicized. The trial will be in a courtroom, but also played over radio throughout the territory controlled by the Vaz, so all can hear the fate of those who oppose him and his new state. Every member of the Presidium will be packed into the courtroom and prosecuted for anti-Russian activities reflecting Yagoda's use of anti-Soviet activities to hunt down those who had once opposed him. Man by man, communist by communist, we will hang them all. Good, good, good.
even more factory output. We need to look at that. That's why we I don't cut down things at all right now. I might spend more, maybe. We'll have to wait and see. Ooh. Can we do anything else here? Japanese relations. Uh, we could actually buy stuff, but eh, it's a lot of PP. We could really use it though, because now we probably made a few more divisions. Yeah, we made one more. Uh, before we do too much though, how much spam of these? Oh my gosh, that's so much manpower. Up to 19 divisions. My goodness. Hmm, we might need to do that. I don't want to spend PP for this. Uh. We can spend more on military. I'll go and do that. Fine, whatever. We have to do that. The Embers of Hope. Sullivan had an odd effect on those he ruled over. He inspired hope, happiness, and the feeling that the future would be friendly. This leaves us in a delicate position in the territory that we have seized from him. Unlike a lot of other areas that we have taken, the people here have, seeming, have seemed genuinely content to have Sullivan in charge. As such, we need to ensure that he and his hope are quickly forgotten. Sullivan himself needs to be disposed of his memory erased and his ideas grounded into dust. We must organize camps for his ideological sympathizers, publicly hang his most vocal supporters, and introduce a reign of terror so to suppress the population. There can be no middle ground, no mercy for socialists and those who help support them. Socialism is like fire. You need to snuff it out at the source. Ever, even smoldering embers can reignite a blaze. End of the Union. Genric Yagoda was now treated well upon his arrival in Zeo, dragged through the street on a rope leash. Every stumble was met with more expl expletives and vicious blows from the posse of eager blackshirts, who had been selected to bring him to the gallows. The citizens called forth from their homes for the occasion, joined him with glee and genuine enthusiasm, for Yagoda's name was once cursed throughout Russia like no other. Stones, rotten food, and feces pelted the bald, gremlin-faced NKVD chief a fifth, a fifth, throughout his agonizing journey to the center of town. By the time he was dragged up a narrow set of st stairs to a wooden platform in town square, Yagoda was barely conscious. Blood ran from a dozen small cuts on his scalp and face. His uniform was slowly with both his filth and that of which had been thrown at him. He's not dead already, is he? Someone shouted angrily. If you've messed up, I'll hang you next to him. No, my boss, you see? Someone slugged Yagoda in the face, eliciting a whimper. He's still alive, but we better do him quick. No, sneered the first voice. Yagoda found himself hauled up right before a face he'd become familiar with during his investigations of the Hobbin exiles, albeit aged and grizzled. Konstantin Rodzewski. Make sure that noose isn't too tight, Bolotov the Vaz remarked as the noose was roughly pulled down around Yagoda's neck. These people came for a show. Something clunked, and the floor fell out from under Yagoda. It was dangling in the air, the noose pressing tight around his throat, but not tight enough. He gasped and coughed, struggling to draw in air as the world darkened around him. It took Genrik Yagoda 20 minutes to die, and Rodzewski savored every wretched, stomach-churning moment. Thus dies the Soviet Union with a parade. Our victory over the communists is no small feat. Despite their fall from grace, they still represented everything that is both cancerous to the Russian people and opposed to that which we stand for. With morale among the troops higher than it has ever been, it's time to publicly showcase our strength. A massive military parade in our capital, Rodzesk, with the majority of our armed forces making an appearance. This, combined with a series of fiery and passionate speeches by beloved Vaz, will truly celebrate the defeat of the communists and prepare both our soldiers and civilians for the upcoming struggle to, on, unite, to unite the rest of the nation. Fight for Russia, but march for your Vaz, make your people proud. Very good. <clears throat> and right now, as you can see, we're just... Uh, I do want to get some planes. That might be really useful. Especially if Tomsk doesn't use any of them, so... Shining lights. Valerie Soblin could see nothing save for the inside of his blindfold. The old N Nissan truck he'd been thrown into stumbled, sl rumbled slowly and quietly throughout the village, where the Red Army had made its final stand. All around him, crisp as birds sung on a summer morning, he could hear the crack of gunshots, the screaming of the dying, and civilians pleading for the lives of their enlisted kin. Even beyond the blindfold, Soblin squeezed his eyes shut and gritted his teeth as the pained voices of people he knew personally drifted to him on the frigid, frigid wind. The noisome chaos of the village soon faded from earshot as a truck picked up speed and began navigating a rough back road. An hour or so passed before they finally came to a stop and Sovereign was roughly manhandled out of the truck's flatbed. Half dragged, half stumbling, he found himself thrown bodily against a wall. Someone grabbed him by the collar and ripped the blindfold away. He saw that the night had fallen, and his captor's flashlights dazzled him briefly. Shadows moved beyond the edge of the light, shadows with rifles at the ready. Glancing around, he noted the blood and bullet holes marked marking the cottage wall he had been put against. His eyes tracked downwards to the source, and Soblin's heart plummeted. Bron Puchero Olanovskoya. Olanovskaya. His close friends in a dozen more slumped against a whitewashed surface with blood pulled out about them. Riddled with holes. No, he whispered a hollowed voice. Fascist monster. Someone prodded him with a rifle barrel and shouted for him to move back. Bad word you, Soblin spat. You and your sick excuse for a state will be buried in history. We will be avenged, all of us. Your vase was going to be strung up and die screaming by the people's hand. <clears throat> Someone punched him hard between his eyes. Half a dozen rifles clacked as their bolts were pulled back. How compelling, sneered the Vaz of the Russians. Please face the wall now. No man, no problem. More stability. Sounds like a... Uh, 
a slogan maybe for like a restaurant, but the Vaz Triumphant. Konstantin Rodzewski has been known by many monikers throughout his life, fascist, rabble-rouser, counter-revolutionary, bandit, but against all odds, and with no shortage of outside help from our eastern benefactors, Rodzewski has now only, not only claimed the title of Vaz, but can truly affirm him as Russia's guy. Renegade Tsars and internal traitors were purged, communists and the hopeful few were conquered, and the mad preacher and this peasant hordes were slaughtered. All is done by Rozevsky's hand. The boss has established a new state baptized in the blood of Russia's enemies. His troops, loyal to the point of death, stand ready to march west and take what's left of Russia. Glory to Russia and glory to the boss. Remember the trifecta, God, nation, labor. Very good. Very, very good. And we get anything else here? I thought we got one more thing here. Uh, we could do that so far. We got over here. Guns. We have 13 divisions now, so we're... Quickly approaching Tomsk's levels of production, which is obviously we're not very good yet, but try for the will. The Bolshevik capital burned, and with it, the last remnants of the Soviet Union. Rodzevsky drew in a lung full of warm, acrid air, air laced with smoke rising from the pile of corpses doused in gasoline and satellite. From atop the armored car he had arrived in, he surveyed the carnage that wrought by his forces and smiled. Shots continued to ring out at a steady pace each one marking the end of another communist rat's existence. The red banners that had once adorned the makeshift Kremlin were being torn down, shredded, pissed on, burned, and otherwise desecrated in whatever way the black shirts saw fit. A thunderous boom rolled across the city as someone set off explosive charges and blew the great statue of Lenin to bits. A similar iconoclasm was being carried out all through the residential areas as portraits of the Bolshevik leaders were piled up and put to the torch in the streets. He had seen this in his dreams, the end, the gl glorious inferno of vengeance and hate scouring the world clean of the Judeo-Bolshevik abomination that usurped the Holy Russia. Just as the great Hitler had done in the West, Rozevsky had done in the East. He had been jeered at, mocked, persecuted for his faith in National Socialism during those years in Habim. Matkovsky had abandoned him. The Whites had split off to follow their false star, and the Reds had never ceased to plague him. Now there's only silence, save for the crackle of gunfire and the roars of the flames, and Rozevsky, Vaz of the Russians, laughed in to an ashen sky. Glory to Russia. I hope here. As a, oh, look at that. We have despotists? Okay. Oh, if you like to read about ag better agricultural methods, please go ahead. We still have libertarian socialists within our country. We can't have that. Basic mechanization with mass mechanization, that is, that's exactly something I was going to just bring up immediately. Because you get more recruitable population factor, which we absolutely need right now. I was going to take a look at this and see what was going on. Mass mechanization, 1.75. Research, 1. 1.5. Nothing there. 4.5. I just want to get whatever we can get to get more manpower. Like, I'll be honest, like, manpower is that's going to be a constant issue. If we can destroy Tomsk, though, we should have enough manpower to finish off and fight whoever. So, the Vals Triumphant, Dark Skies, Zaya, Cheetah, Magadan, Arkutsk. The Swastika. It flies over every corner of eastern Siberia. The streets are quiet and orderly, save for the roving gangs of black shirts who continue to drag enemies of the state from their homes and set them dangling from the gallows. The strong rule and the weak suffer what they must, toiling for the betters in the mines and concentration camps. Dozens die every day, crushed beneath the Russian jackboot. Finally, all it is it should be in a reborn Russia. There remains much to do before we turn our gaze westwards and begin the liberation of all of Russia. With their immediate threats disposed of and the RFP secure, the Vaz now has the opportunity to carry out his planned reorganization of the nation. We still want for the many things necessary for victory, proper industry, modern agriculture, and a large-scale armaments production, just to name a few. But no minor setbacks can stop us from fulfilling our destiny. We have risen from our Siberian backwater to claim the entirety of the Far East. Our enemies lie broken, burned, and buried. Every foe we have faced has been shattered by the iron fist of National Socialism. The same will be true for any other Jewish puppet who dares stand before us. Us. The skies dock, and not with gloom or defeat or destruction, but under the shadow of our glory, invigorated by God and given form in the Vaz, Savior of Russia, nothing can stop us now. The heart of Russia? The pride of Russia. Oh, I like that. That's pretty good to get immediately. The hands of Russia. Oh, more political powers is pretty good too. The soul of Russia. I do want to get through this one very quickly, but I want to go with our pride of Russia, because this is something I know, almost no, normally do. I usually just go and do the administrative stuff, but... Our professionalism is going to be extremely important for us. Russia has much to be proud of, paramount of which, of course, is the military. The Russian has a long and glorious history of martial success, and we are the natural heirs to the glory of the Slavic conquest. To continue this legacy, we must expand and modernize our armed forces to defeat the Zionist puppets to our west and anyone else who would be so audacious as to dare challenge the Vaz and his brave soldiers. New weapon designs, new tanks, planes, and ships. New logistical systems, of course, to make sure that the entire apparatus would remain connected and effective. Everything must be renovated and rejuvenated to make sure this that the army, the pride of Russia, remains at the forefront of our concerns and is transformed into the shining example of Rodzewski's militant National Socialism. The Soul of Russia 
Now that we've slaughtered the Renegade and his supporters, ended the Tsar's pitiful bid for power, destroyed the Bolshevik remnants to our west, and ground the heretics' fathers into dust, we can finally see that the Vaz position, both within and without, is secure. We can, no, we must make official the all-Russian government of the Far East and consolidate our hold on the territory that we have sacrificed so much to conquer, no matter the cost. The soul of Russia, Konstantin Rozevsky, our eternal Vaz, will be able to lead our movement forwards, ensuring the successes of the Russian fascist party. No dissenter will be spared, no treasonous Bolshevik will be left to ferment a revolution, and no scheming Jew will be permitted to stand in the way of a truly Russian state. Now and forevermore, we can say for God, nation, of course, labor. Very nice. The pride of Russia. Hopefully we can get some more manpower through here. A strong army? No. Okay. Proud army? No. Okay. A devoted army? Yes. Yes, that is very good. But I want to get through this stuff very quickly. What do we want here? Our great future... Spawns two elite divisions, security service, not bad. Our humble origins, bitter disappointment. I like the stability, I like that a lot. Scheming Jew, exercise uh, cancer, ooh. Find them, listen, catch them. Grew up in cold mouth. New Russian society, I like that one. The Russia that has been known for decades is the one of weakness dominated by the communists and the Jews no more. The true sons of Russia have bled and died to destroy the weak reality, sacrificing themselves to ensure that a national state is rebuilt in the vision of the only man brave enough to begin, organize, and lead the Russian fascist party to victory. The Vaz has announced the formation of what he calls the new Russian society. He has published, among many other things, a guidebook for how any good Russian uh, fascist family should operate. The man at the head of the house, the woman at his heel. Uh, <clears throat> And their children educated and kept busy by the party, of course. All true Russians will surely be more than willing to adopt this new society. For, if they offer resistance, they are, are they interested in nothing but dividing our nation further? This is one of the rare times I'm spending both military and civilians uh, spending as much as I am right now. Very weird. We could... Yeah, I don't mind maybe buying a thing of artillery then. Um, yeah. Artillery's very good. Uh, we get more stability and war support, but we're not super needing that right now, so... A new day. When Konstantin Rodzewski awoke, the first thing he felt was a familiar throbbing pain in his head. It was particularly bad this morning, and as usual, Rodzewski could not recall exactly how he had spent the previous night. With a sluggish pace, he opened his eyes and gave a half-hearted glance at the alarm clock on his nightstand. Rodzewski's sight was blurred, and he could not make out the time at first. After a moment, his eyes finally adjusted and revealed the hour half-past two in the morning. Or in the afternoon, actually. His head still aching and his body sapped of energy, Rodzewski clumsily rolled out of his bed and landed on the floor with a loud thud. He acted out a few pain coughs and mumbled an obscenity, but was still too groggy to be phased by the slight pain the fall gave him. When everything already hurts, what was a little more going to do? Pulling himself together, Rodzewski rose to his feet and opened the blinds to his window, revealing the near perpetually frozen city of Zaya. Light flooded into the poorly lit room, and the sudden burst of sunlight caused Rodzewski to flinch. The vast view his third-story room had given him quickly reminded the fascist leader of his recent accomplishments. This land. From like by call, in the west, to Kamchatka in the east, was his and his alone. All of Rodzewski's enemies were either dead or wishing they were, and his dreadful armies had their boots firmly on the neck of the Russian Far East. This thought gave Rodzewski a great deal of comfort. Looking out into the distance, Rodzewski began to feel excitement for the future that he had not felt in some time. If these victories were to continue, he thought, all of Russia would be at his mercy, along with all the undesirables hiding therein. A great darkness arises in the east. Very good. Um, how are we doing here? Not bad, not bad. We're doing better on that, that's good. Guns are fast enough. Tank equipment should hopefully do okay. So we'll see. Uh, better motorized? Sure, why not? I'm not sure how much that's actually going to help. But I think up next, what we're going to do is the one that gives us a little more manpower. A devoted army. But let's do the civilian stuff first. There you go. Thank you. Just because I want that extra manpower now. I want to make as many divisions as possible. Fight for your nation, fight for your ancestry, fight for your god, and most of all, fight for your vase. Today, the first wave of advertisements and propaganda has been sent out to the territory that we control. This round of encouragements, the first of many according to the vase, is aimed at enticing a large population base to begin to volunteer for the free all-Russian army. Realistically, one of the main issues that we struggle with is the maintenance of our manpower reserves. Dreamed by the vast territory that we occupy and a low population base that e of even the most populous urban centers are under our control. Thus, the vase has come up with an ingenious Offensive, to ensure that the youth of our nation sign up for the army in droves. It'll be their blood upon which our new Russia is built, but the new Russian society. The curtains have been drawn shut in the Vaz office in Rozesk. After a long day of speeches, meetings, tours, and dictates, a more lethargic man would be interested in kicking back, having a nice dinner, and sleeping early. Konstantin Rodzewski was anything but a lethargic man, of course. <clears throat> Following a short dinner and copious amount of liquor that came with it, he had secluded himself in his office, locking the door and drawing the curtains. Starting well into the evening, and riding well into the crack of dawn, the Vaz of all Russians sat at his desk, drinking and writing madly, a man in the throes of passion and inspiration. He was drafting another of his so-called magnum opuses, this one on what he viewed was a perfect and ideal Russian society, a new society, and one that would impose on Russia for the good of her people. 
Had his office's housekeeper came to serve him breakfast in the early hours of the morning, the vase, whose night had been fueled by a combination of liquor and caffeinated beverages, was finishing up his work. Delving into a hearty breakfast to temper the liquor and his oncoming hangover, Konstantin Rozeski looked over his work. It was 48 pages, single space, and dealt with us every single possible detail in his envisioned society. From his intensive use and integration of state-sponsored organizations like the Union of Fascist Little Ones and the Russian Women's Fascist Movement, to the in-depth outlining of the way in which households functioning, with a man at the head of the house, of course, and the general militarization of society, every aspect of what he believed to be a perfect society was tackled. Waving the thick manuscript around as he ate, he felt nothing but pride. Once he had finished his breakfast, he summoned Bolotov so he could show off his new work. A new society to drive Russia forward. We're getting so much peepee, I love it. Alright, so after this, we're going to go back... Oh, look to the future. Main battle tanks. Ooh, or population. I like the population a lot, but... More men, more guns. 1% more recruitable population is exactly what we could use. But we'll see. The Union of Little Fascist Ones. Less monthly population. Well, so we replace restricted child labor with legal child labor. Ooh! The Russian fascist movement. Oh, we'll do that one. We'll talk about women first. There's a reason that superstitions are known as old wives' tales. There is, is there nothing more dangerous than an idle woman left her own devices whose overly active imagination will do nothing but generate rumors and ideological deviation? Well, it is indisputable that a woman's place is at the side of her man. As one who cares for their household, we should ensure that all the women of Russia are just as ideologically pure as their husbands. Thus, it would be best if we reactivated the Russian women's fascist movement, an organization that promotes the true and traditional values for women and squashes the dangerous sentiment that women should be anything more than homemakers. This movement, while strictly voluntary, voluntary, will have local meetings where these women will not only be instructed in the role for society, but also, also the nuances of our doctrine, as much as they could possibly understand it. Nice. And we go back over here. Yes. 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 Weekly manpower. Screw it. Oh, that's 135. We'll do that one. Stability. We're kind of okay on stability, so we're kind of wait on that one. So, good. Oh, we got more. Nice. Yes, 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 yes. yes. That's why I saved the PP the entire time. Actually, we currently have 0.9 every day. It's not bad. Um, I don't mind getting more infrastructure, maybe. Uh, industrial equipment, military factory. Get more construction speed. We need that. And industrial equipment. Poverty, yes, please. Uh, pretty much everything. I don't even mind bu building the roads up right now. Just so we can build things faster. That's that's really why I'll, I'll do that. Not bad. Artillery's looking god-awful, but guns are looking good. Guns are looking quite good, actually. Quite, quite good. And we're at 8. Not terrible. Oh, and we can hire four instructors. Yeah, absolutely that one. Nice. Very, very good. I'm glad we saved all that PP up though, and the little the union of fascist little ones. Or is there anything else we can do for like removing um, the administrative bloat? We do get more political power there, which is good. Yeah, we'll do. We'll keep going on this one. The union of fascist little ones. Once many years ago, the Russian fascist party had a number of wings. Paramount wings. A paramount among them was the union of fascist little ones. This organization, led and organized by the black shirts, was for the education and occupation of many youths in Habin and throughout the rest of Manchuria. However, with the Vaz foray into Russia proper, it had to be put on hold. But now, as Rodzevsky works to consolidate his control of the Far East, he is ordered to not just restart the program, but to extend it through all all of the territory controlled by the party. Logistical complications aside, this would be nothing but useful for a state, as the planners behind it have already drawn up. A number of physical projects, in reality, labor intensive enterprises to build character and instill discipline. And if worse comes to worse, the union will be handy to mobilize in any potential wartime desperation. A woman's lot. Women of Russia, no, be not beguiled by the honeyed words promising liberation. The true woman, as conceived by God, no longer exists in the decadent West. She's been hanged with the rope of Judeo Bolshevik, Judeo -Bolshevik feminism. Her successor is a degenerate, liberated woman, the whore of Babylon. This wicked harlot thinks of nothing of snuffing out unborn lives in her womb. And for what? That she might enrich herself with a career meant for her husband? Oh, but how rarely does she need one of those? Faithful m monogamy is not for her. She is happy, happier when she has an unending line of sinners with which to fornicate endlessly. Devoid of any morality, love, or faith, she ends her life as a ruined, dishonored, and drug-addicted Jezebel. Such is how the Jews would have you, as well. To embrace Western feminism is to cast off all that makes a woman pure and godly. In Russia, we understand that God is a place for all of us. For men, that place is in the front lines and in the factories. For you blessed wives, sisters, daughters, and mothers, that place is the safety of the home and church. You are empowered by the Lord to bear life anew. Only from your natural state can happiness spring. The joy of raising children, of welcoming your man home after a hard day of work, of finding comfort in the embrace of the masculine sex. Children, kitchen, church. Children, kitchen, church. Yeah, that's what Hitler said about women, too. The Azbuka Fajizma. 
Anti-Semitism, a call to action against the world's greatest and most dangerous enemy, intransigence against Jewry, and a program that establishes a system to guarantee against the penetration of the international community. These are, in a corrupt and entropic times, the main sign of the goodness, wisdom, and potential of any organization or movement that will be key in ensuring that the elders of Zahn do not overtake those good of heart and mind. Arbaz has deemed it necessary and good to distribute his writings throughout the nation, publicizing them as the ABCs of fascism. This work has been published and circulating for quite some time, however. Rozevsky has decreed that every man, woman, and child will have access to the work through the state distribution of his little brown books, which are designed to be cheap to print and able to distribute to all from the urbanite factory worker to the most remote villager. Good. Character building. It had been a month since Fyodor had last seen his parents, a whole month filled with the kind of work that even his father could barely manage. At least Fyodor had all his friends and the little ones to help. Well, mostly. He couldn't call them all friends, Anatoly. The big black shirt there to protect them with his Japanese machine gun wasn't friendly at all. Fyodor didn't really get why they needed protecting in the first place. All the Jews in his town had been taken away and the fighting with the Reds was over, so why did Anatoly have to be there? All he did was bully them. At night. They slept on thin mattresses with little more than rags to cover them. Even then, in pitch dark of the barracks, someone else watched them. Sometimes the door would creak open so that someone could shine a flashlight across the room and make sure none of them were huddled together for warmth. Such behavior bred degeneracy and femininity, the leader later said. Every morning came the overseer, rousing them before dawn with the clamor of a brass bell. The racket always signaled the same thing, another 14 hours of splinters, bleeding fingers, broken toes, and harsh blows of the overseer's truncheon. The vase was right, though, thought Fyodor, the path of righteousness labor, or righteous labor, was full of hardships. Kolya and Sasha had washed out already. Some of the others whispered about how their pair had tried to escape and were caught, but Fyodor knew the truth. They had fall failed their race, just like his cousin Tom Ch Tilma. They weren't real Russians, but I am, and I'll prove it. Wow, we got some manpower. I love the union of fascist little ones. And live for your boss. Konstantin Rozevsky, or Konstantin Vladimirovich Rozevsky, boss of all Russians and head of the all-Russian government, as a paramount leader in the Far East, and that is something that will never change. His tact, wisdom, strength, and skilled strategic thought are all traits that should be both celebrated and emulated by any true Russian, but it is not enough to just celebrate the Vaz and his many talents. The Russian people should live by the Vaz and die by the Vaz. They should think of him in their waking hours and dream of him in their sleep, for Konstantin Rozevsky as a savior of the Russian nation and is due the respect that he deserves. Thus, we must embark on a multifaceted attempt to ensure that the people know the importance of their leader, keeping him in their hearts and minds and for now and forevermore. Pictures of the vows should be made available and mandatory to display in the home. The life of our dear leader must be learnt in school. Our workers and farmers must pledge allegiance to the Vazevsky before they start work each day. This is how the people will live for their vows. As it should be. Hey, 6.4%, not bad. Not bad at all. Only 88% here believe in National Socialism? What's wrong with these people? Wow, that literally just doubled or something. That's not good. Live for your vase. Very good. And where is it? Civilian budget boost? Keep spending, keep spending, keep going. That's fine with me. Uh, where is it? Well, yeah, that's really nice. That's really nice to get. Overextended administration, so we get... So we're actually doing not too bad. This will help us get more recruitable population factor, stability, consumer goods factories, political power gain, because we're, we're at one. We're already one. That's, that's pretty good, but live for your God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the, in the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the Church of God in which he obtained from his own blood. The Holy Russian Orthodox Church is one of the primary aspects of Russian culture and expression. Ever since his arrival in Zaya and the establishment of the all-Russian government, Konstantin Rozevsky has worked hard to integrate church and state by working with the Orthodox Church of the Far East by coordinating with them. However, it's time to do away with the legal fiction that our church is an independent institution. We should promote our church further, but also need to integrate it with the RFP further. The clergy will be ordained not just as priests, but as members of the RFP, and prayers will be made for the success of the Vaz and his party. Homilies will focus on the Russian fascist values, the patriarch, a man appointed by the Vaz whose position will pay more than lip service to his patron. By doing all this, we will make the Orthodox Church a branch of the government in all but name. Good. Slightly more population, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Lessons from Europe. Oh, that's really good to get. Oh, my goodness. The Heart of Russia would be really good to do. Persecute the enemy? Uh, let's do the Congress of the Russian Fascist Party. It would be unfair to claim, officially at least, that the Vaz was the only individual in the Russian Fascist Party with any due diligence in running the state. <clears throat> The fa Russian Fascist Party is, after all, a party, and any worthwhile party would ensure that the voices of its members are heard. Thus, the Vaz has announced a Grand Congress of the Russian Fascist Party, where all senior and junior members will attend to voice their opinions and decide on the matters of the state going forward in true fascist 
fashion. However, Rozeski and every other party member already knew that there was going to be exactly one opinion on the way forward, and that opinion was of Oz. Rozeski, in the darkest days of his tenure in the parties, committed wide-reaching purges of all those who posed an ideological danger to the Russian fascist party, and thus himself. There's no RFP without Rozeski. It simply wouldn't be able to exist, and thus there would be no opinion other than Rozeski's. Alright, keep focusing on, focusing on industry. We could do that, but we definitely need to do some of this as well. One hand in industry, and the other hand in war, in uh, armaments. So when can we do this? Prepare for war? It has to be 69, so we got some time before we have to go there, which is good. That is very, very good. And we'll speak with Boltov next. We have actually 9,000 people still in reserve. Wow. That is actually nice. How, much, how many divisions do we have? Because I just kind of let it set and forget, set and forget what we had. We have 16. That's actually not too bad. They have... Jesus Christ! Yeah, I'm not sure we can actually be able to win this one. The guys are only 20 combat. Hold on. Let's take a look here. Um, stockpile? I'm sure they got plenty of stuff, right? Plenty. Oh my goodness. Ah, they don't have that many. But division-wise, like... We don't know how good their divisions are, because they have some light infantry, they might have some 20 combat with infantry, they might have 40 combat with infantry, but we'll speak with Boltov next. Rozeski's dearest security minister, Boltov, who presided over and helped orchestrate the Vaz purges, has come to the Vaz with his tantalizing idea. The formation of the Security Assurance Squads, these squads, officially known as the Otraidi Obespechnia, Obespechnosti, or OOB, would be an equivalent to the Nazis' SS. They would supplement the Blackshirts who already perform an uncountable number of duties for the state and are truthfully a tad overextended. The organization would remain under the control of Bolotov himself. No one knows more than Rozeski himself how important the Schutzstaffel was to the Nazis, as well as a key role in Germany's politics. On one hand, it would give us an additional branch of the party that would have a sizable reach in the military and civilian lives of the Russians, and would give the overworked Blackshirts a bit of a break. On the other, it would give a large amount of power to Bolotov, but the Vaz knows Bolotov, and the Vaz is in control. Deathly silence. Rozevsk is a new city for the Russian fascist party. The chaos of Habin is gone, replaced by the Moabit Solidarity, enforced by Sherahar Shekharev's Black Church. The name is merely the first indication that this is the center of the Vaz control. No corner or alleyways free of the eyes and ears of loyal party members on the outlook of traitors to hand up the chain of command. And the most attentive of them is within the party congress. Dozens of supposedly loyal party members have been exposed as Zionist sympathizers in the past days, as the behests of the true loyalists. A deceased cousin of, who married a Jew, a brother who visited family in Magadan before the reconquest, even a lapsed registration of the HQ years ago, are all enough to draw suspicion and arrest. Gregory uh, Shekarev recuses himself from the Congress, preferring to stalk amongst the shadows in the back and watch for suspicious behavior, or listen for further, in further information he can use, while his blockers patrol the halls of the building and streets of the Rodzevsk. He must personally report that he has heard to the Vaz. Other party members cannot be trusted, according to Rodzevsky, and Shekarev cannot lose his credibility, not without severe consequences. Even more conspicuous is Alexander Bolotov, who makes himself quite visible during the Congress. Those who are seen cannot be conspiring, and may be more loyal than those who have something to hide. The Vaz sees Bolotov working on his behalf, and is pleased to see the loyalty of his inner circle. Yet Bolotov is more active and alert than Shekarev, knowing his position of favor depends on his ability to find out those who oppose the Vaz. And in the center of the event, the Vaz himself sniffs out conspiracy, always alert for Jewish sympathizers or traitors within the RFP. Now that the party has been purged of its disloyal members, the only way to go was west, to the unreclaimed lands of the Russian nation. When the reminder, remainder of the puppets have been wiped out, then Russia would be free, free to forge your own destiny without malign influences. His authority is secured. Uh, we could get both for industry and electronics. I do like that. What is this one? Weekly manpower goes up? Yeah, I don't mind doing that one. That's, that's pretty good to do. Mm, industry? We can do one for industry probably too. That'll be fine. Uh, our great failure... Security service or our humble origins. I like that a lot, but we don't need that much. Spawns four units. Four units of black shirts, though. Our great future. Hmm. Well, I don't want Bolto to get too much power here. I don't want to have cost. I don't really care about the cost right now. Uh. It seems like we did. We said no to him last time, so maybe we'll do him this time. Our great future. The. Otradi Obespechnia Bezopasnosti. It has a nice ring to it. Despite the German troubles with their SS, the Vaz is wise enough to know that not to ever let the OOB get out of hand. The black shirts are overextended, and the OOB would be the perfect tool to cement the RFP's control over the populace, a reign of peace for the compliant, and a reign of terror for the dissidents. And what's more is that in times of war, the OOB can fight alongside our regular troops, and black shirts just as the SS did, oftentimes meaning the difference between glorious victory and humiliating defeat. 
Molotov can have his branch, and he'll cast a long shadow over Russia and her internal enemies. The Bolshevik and the Jew will know a new type of fear, one that will penetrate their being straight to the core, and that will uh, keep them up at night, and will further unify our fine nation against their perfidious efforts to destroy the Russian people. Truly, the OOB will help us build a great, glorious future. And keep spending, keep spending, spending, spending. We're at least 20, that's good. You can go down for now, because I want to make sure that we can keep building up civvies. We need a bigger, 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 huge industry. But security assurances. The atmosphere in the party HQ was a far cry from the Hobbin headquarters with the Neon Swaska. Back then, Rodzilski had been less paranoid and less pliable. Now, even entering the Vaz office was an exercise in duplicity. Even uh, <clears throat> Shek Shekarev's men watched the entire entrance completely, and only on rare occasions was Bolotov able to speak with the Vaz privately. He knocked and hedged, twitching back and forth to look for the black shirts, and then whipped his head back to the door as Rodzilski snapped, it from in fr snapped at him from inside. Enter! He slipped into the room quite quickly. The boss sat behind the desk, glaring at his lieutenant. Sorotnik Bolotov. It's good you're here. I need you to investigate something for me. Reports of smugglers in the port of Magadan. Shekharov said they're remnants of the traitors, intent on causing trouble for us until their last dying breath. Normally being interrupted in his goals in such a manner would have upset Bolotov, and in his younger days he would have taken out his frustration on a random victim, snatched from the streets of Habim. But decades of loyal service to the Vaz had taught him much of the man, and this was an opportunity to advance his cause, not a burden to be taken on. We seem to be beset by enemies on all sides, my boss. Might I make a suggestion? Uh, speak, Alexander. What was that irritation he detected? Soratnik Shekharev's men seem to have proven unable to keep out the pernicious influence of our enemies. The Blackshirts have served our purpose as well, but they are lacking in organization and equipment. I suggest we create a newer, more specialized unit with proper military training and advanced education on how to spot enemies of the state. The best, most loyal men we can find on the model of the German paramilitaries. The boss contemplated this idea momentarily and then issued the judgment. A strong proposal, Stuart. Nick, do it. The Blackshirts serve us perfectly well. Do not speak of this again. Uh, we'll do that one. It seems like we could probably get cooed eventually, but the banner above. In the darkest days, when the Vaz and his most loyal were freezing in the underdeveloped Zaya, and even earlier in Halbin, many drastic measures had to be taken. The Russian fascist party was, instru was structured in a way that likened comparisons to organized crime syndicates. Blackshirt thugs would patrol the streets, beating those weak enough or dumb enough to be caught in their crosshairs. The party's leaders, Rodzevsky included, acted more like a mafia, doling out gifts and ordering hits. While this was effective when our party was scratching out a meager existence and surviving on the scraps of political fanaticism, it is no way to operate a major nation. One with the bid, no, the inevitability of United the Russian people and the nation. Luckily, through Rodzevsky's skilled political maneuvering, we've managed to purge the most undesirable aspects of, and individuals from a party and reform it into a functioning political organ. This going forward will allow us to operate above board and effectively. In fact, above as, as well. Securing the state. You have been selected as the most loyal examples of what an ideal Russian should be. The Vals has personally approved the creation of our new social security assurance squads to destroy the influence of Zionist traders in our country. You will build this organization for us, and the Vals will supply you with what you need. I expect lists to be formed of good, reliable soldiers. You are responsible for their training and obedience. Boltov smiled as he addressed the first officers of the OOB. Under the nose of Shekharev, he had triumphed and received permission for his own power base, but there were still many obstacles. He would need weapons, uniforms, a network of bureaucracy to manage the list, and many more resources. Still, his star was certainly rising. The trust of the Vals was rare and was becoming common for it to ebb and flow on Rzeski's whim. This momentary success would surely not last, but Boltov had clawed his way further up in the status, and now possessed a knife which he could use to give the Vaz enemies what they deserved. We shall root out every traitor. Good, and these are... Really? Ten combat width? Um, that's nice. Asano? No, I don't want to convert Asanos. Here, they want to be special? We'll do that one. Now we have 19 divisions. Not nearly enough to kill off Tomsk. Or, heck, even Omsk, which doesn't exist anymore, but still. I can't believe still have a deficit, but that's good. That is very good. The Heart of Russia, I really want to do that one really badly. Ooh. Research facilities, X, please. Ah, that stuff is okay. It's not really super great. Oh, we get slavery. Look at that. Persecute the enemy. Russia is a country beset on all sides, and we're still within by enemies, Bolsheviks, Freemasons, and worst of all, the Jews. All scheme to see a Russia weakened by communism and internal division. We know our enemy, but the people that we rule over do not. Mere months ago, many of them were oppressed by the very Bolsheviks that we despise. Many true Russians still live and work alongside Jews and communist sympathizers. This will not do and cannot do. Our people must know their enemy. With our force, paramilitary, or otherwise, we can identify every single one of our enemies and enact sufficient measures on them. Make them targets of public shaming, force them to wear identification of their genetic and political stains, and collect their names and information on a very, very long list. As luck would have it, we have a security minister who is highly experienced in compiling these lists and acting on them with extreme prejudice. Sounds like fun. Sounds like a lot of fun. 
And better trucks, just in case. And you know what, here? Let's see, how are our engineers? We need better engineers. I want more entrenchment. We're going to need to dig in as much as possible when we fight our enemies. Oh boy. The Trishan's Bolshevik only regret. How many years has it been? Lev Ahokdin thought to himself as he walked down the main street of Cheetah. Fifty years or so? That sounded about right. So much had changed since he left the city with his family in 1920. There were a number of apartments and unfamiliar buildings where they had once only stood houses. The roads were much better paved than they remembered, too, but some buildings, mainly landmarks like the museum and church, remained the same. Ahokdin tried to recognize any familiar face in the throngs who walked among the streets. He turned his gaze to the old woman, that mark on her cheek, that could have only been Mr. Yakhantova, who ran the store down the street from his house and gave him and his friends candy for free. Ohokton was going to say something when Yakhantova realized he was looking at her. Turning white with fear, she hid her face and scurried away. As Ohokton tried to pick up individual people in the crowd, more and more people of them, more and more of them, did the same, covering their faces in fear, trying not to catch his attention. He tried to call out to a man with a sandy blonde hair that Ohokton recognized as a schoolmate, Dmitry Lebedinsky. Dimasha. How? Please, I didn't do anything, Dmitry cried out. Oh, I... Ahokten didn't know what to say as Dimitri fled. He felt like an idiot who said the wrong word to some passerby. Was he not? He thought as his heart sank with fort solitude. Not longer the second most powerful, uh, no longer the most second most powerful man in the Far East, but just as another man isolated on a crowded street. Ours is a high and lonely destiny. Very much so. The treasonous Bolshevik. We have torn down their institutions and shot every single member of the government that we could get our hands on. Tell me, Bolotov, what more can we do? One of the greatest enemies of Russian society, along with the Jew and the Freemason, is a Bolshevik. Even after the destruction of the government in the Far East and the systematic execution of anyone associated with the regime, the sympathizers still remain, stirring up trouble and sowing discord among our people and our government. These wretched creatures, though many of them may speak our language and look alike us, are not Russians. They are not even humans, and we must keep that in mind as we hunt them down like the dogs they are. Very good. Fighters will be good. Very, very good. Actually, are we even making fighters? I think we might be. Yeah, we are. We barely make any, as well as cast. But that'll all come in necessary. Very, very necessary. The new lists. Konstantin Rodzewski sat in his office. Boltov and Shekarev sat across the desk from him. All of them had provided the balls with a series of very, very long lists, and their families who were either Jews, communists, or were simply too cozy with either group. The lists were way too long for the balls to read them personally. As a player had come in with their respective lists, Rodzewski had looked from the list sitting on his desk back to the pair. Is this everyone he asked the pair of them? The pair looked at each other, the rivals briefly united in intention. This is the start, my boss, Boltov answered. There's a lot more where this is coming from. The boss nodded his head in understanding. He thought for a moment before grimacing. These dudes, he started. These complete dudes. A brief, brief pause before he continued. Jews, communists, these creatures have long plagued our nation. They've infiltrated our people, our culture, and morphed it, weakened it. They've made us rot, turned once brave Russians into cowardly fools, made this bravest tepid, the strongest weak. And for years they've done this, and no one has had the courage to do anything about it. Most Shekharev and Baltov nodded, not out of fear, but genuine belief. They lo the look in their eyes betrayed their zeal. The boss continued, This is a good start, but it is not enough. We need to purge the rot, to cut out the infection by any means necessary. I want these names taken care of, but I want more names. Russia shall be cleansed of the toxins afflicting her. The purge, of course, continues. Not bad. Really not bad at all. No regrets. It had been so long, Vasily Tersin thought to himself as his car drove down the streets of Irkutsk. Once he was a young cadet who studied at the military academy here under the whites at first, but under the both Soviets much longer. Now he was one of the top generals of the all-Russian government of the Far East. Funny how that worked out. He passed a corner where the old pub used to stand where he and his fellow officer cadets used to drink on weekends. Now it was an apartment office or building. A shame, he thought. Maybe if it gets posted here, he'll have it rebuilt. But Tyrson wasn't here to sightsee and reminisce about his youth. He wasn't here on official businesses. The car piled up to an old apartment building. Even this was still standing here, he thought. He and a squad of soldiers exited the car and headed into the building. He was told that may the head of a major spy ring lived here, and it was his job to collect him before he could be properly liquidated. According to the Intel papers, the spy master lived here, apartment 129. A private busted down the door, and a man with a light brown beard, pale wisps, gray with age, stood shocked at the man. Akim? The guy who used to buy him drinks at the pub? Akim shouted, tears streaming down his face as Tyrson read the arrest warrant, and the soldier dragged him out of the apartment. Please, you can't do this to me. Basia, please. As the soldier threw him into the truck, Tyrson kneeled down to him and spoke a single sentence to him, his voice cold as ice. This is a professional relationship. The Scheming Jew. There's no greater villain in Russia and the world today than the Jew. The Jew intent on destroying Russia and controlling the world through the shadow governments that they attempt to impose upon the world's leaders must be stopped. For if it isn't, we will never see a fair or just world. 
Every Jew is an agent of their plan, an instrument of their destruction. It is in their blood and their brain. This is why we cannot abide by their coexistence with those of pure Russian heritage. They poison our people, act against our people, and they are the servants of the internal Zionist elders. These scheming Jews are at the root of our suffering and the struggles of the world. This is why we must put them on our list, know who they are, and prepare to take action against them. The scribe of note. Or a scribe of note. Alright, we've got to keep going this way. That'll be good. In our total struggle against the wrong-thinking people of the world, the kosher fascists who have infiltrated our own party, we must exalt those who create a proper depiction of the rightful state of the world. One where the Russian is free to live in, pr in, to live in prosperity, without fear of the wretches, wretches and fiends that, seem, that steal from the hard-earned wealth, and as such, a depiction has been created by one of our own, in the form of a personal history of the great luminary Mikhail Spasovsky, a fine example of the leaders of the Russian fascist party that has produced in its storied history. In his extensive recollection of the early days of our organization, he presents the struggle that we went through over the many years in Manchuria. In the light of the great Neon Swaska, our party grew strong, and when the weakened Bukharanists collapsed in the face of superior national socialism, we seized our chance. As one who has led a cause from the first day in exile, I can say that there is no more truthful depiction of our history than Spazkowski's book, The Long Road North. I despise simpering intellectuals, but Soroknik Sp Spazovsky is no such thing. He has created a work that I recommend to all Russians who wish, wish to strengthen their knowledge of the heritage. History is written by the victors. Exercise the cancer. Oh boy, academic basics gets worse. We have our list. We know their names. We know where they live, where they work, and who they trust. It is time to root out the rot. And then the Mall of Horror. Captain Sasha Minikin watched in horror as a soldier of the all-Russian government descended upon a Burat village. The captain and his partisans have been fighting against the Mad Vaz in Amur since the fall of Baratia. Even after the, best, the death of Comrade Soblin, the Red Army units still under his command did not simply disappear. They kept up the fight in cells all throughout the fascist territory. Sasha and his men have been tracking this group of fascists from the moment they entered Baratia, preparing to ambush them at their most vulnerable. As far as he knew, none of, them, none of the remnants of the Red Army had sought shelter in the village below them. The people of the village were innocent of any collaboration, but that was never something that mattered to the Rodzewski's dogs. The dudes had gathered the men of the village in the central square. The women and children were nowhere to be seen, though they were probably hiding in their homes. Sasha would have called for an attack if it weren't for the numerical inferiority of his forces. The fascists outnumbered them two to one and were better equipped besides. As a result, they could only watch as the men were lined up against the walls of the local temple and shop. When the last man fell to the ground, the soldiers began pulling barrels of fuel out of their trucks. Barrels of oil were poured onto the houses and shops as the innocent people within screamed in horror. Anyone who tried to run was shot before they got far. The temple was the last to be ransacked and prepared to burn. When all was ready, the soldiers set to fire to every building in the village. Captain Sasha Minikin could do nothing but weep as the winds carried the screams of the dying to his men. All around him, men wept and rushed as the village burned. Sasha looked down at his uniform, at the rank insignia that rested there. With tears in his eyes, he ripped it off and threw it to the ground. He was unfit to wear it. The consequences of resistance. And cancer must be excised. Very good. We need oh, so much more manpower. Effective total manpower is modified to 108%, which is not, which is pretty good. Which is pretty good, I'd say. We're still cutting down debt. What's not to love? Overall, we need way more artillery, so how about we buy some from the Japanese? It's only 150, but 150 more is better than nothing. We have 19 divisions, Scheming Jew, and the Lebai Sakharov. Oh my god, there's so many divisions. We have only 19. Oh my goodness. Uh, the Vaz Radio Address. In the past decades, the all-Russian government has come far. Throughout the years of struggle against the enemies of our party and our people, we have clashed with communists of the old Bolshevik regime, waged holy war against the zealots in Siberia, and have been beset by turncoats who refuse to call to form a stronger Russia. And yet, we are still here. The last of the two have overcome their oppressors and risen to the rightful place as the leaders of Siberia. But do not let success dull your perception, for it is a candle in the wind, burning bright in fits and starts. And in the darkness lie those who wish to snuff it out. But do, we do not tolerate the inequities of Bolshevism, and so the Bolshevik remnants protest and try to bring us down. We do not tolerate parasitism, and so the parasites cry out in secret demise. As a shadow of our stature grows, so grows the shadows of which the agents of Zionism can scheme against us. Do not fail to be vigilant, for if you fail to spot a traitor, it is as if you have betrayed the Russian people and enacted the plot yourself. We have come far, but the Russian nation before us is secure. Before secure, we must go farther. It is the duty of every citizen to be on watch for the spies of the false government to our west, the lying communists, and the scheming Jew, for then they can only work against us in darkness. Drag them into light and expose their crimes. If you see something, Say something. We must. You must. You have to. Find them, list them, catch them. Find them, list them, catch them. These are the three orders going out to the Black Church and the army today. Three orders. Six words total. That's all they need. Today the Baz himself announced from the balcony in Rodzevsk, with much pomp and circumstance, that he will finally do something about Russia's Jewish problem. He has mobilized the Russian fascist party's paramilitary wing, the Black Church, which will be supported by the armed forces, to begin hurting Jews within our borders into ghettos. The ghettos will be cramped, dirty, and very, very visible to remind all those within and without what happens to those who plotted the downfall of Russia. 
spend. We have to spend only by spending enough that we will have hopefully enough divisions to hold out against our enemies. If we need to save two, so be it for now. Save two. Because hopefully that'll help us out with our artillery. We've got plenty of guns which we'll need to help put down resistance. And we have a little bit of manpower. It's probably better to use the manpower for now and make some planes. We almost have full air wings here. Or at least for fighters. That's actually very good. Train them. That'd be good. Good. Reopen Kolyma. Remember the, Bash the Russian forefathers and their forefathers fought and died for a great nation. They worked for their hands to be the bone to build a better Russia. And here we stand with the likes of you people, the very people who seek to destroy what our ancestors have worked towards. It's time that you pay for your people's actions against our nation. We will no longer be the ones working until we wither away here, where gold and platinum lay just beneath our feet. You will work to repay the sins of your people. Today the prison camps in Kolyma have been officially reopened. Albeit this time under the closed supervision of the RFP, here Jewish pr prisoners and other dissidents, especially Bolsheviks, will work absurd hours under incredibly dangerous conditions to pay their debts to Russian society through the extraction of the vast mineral wealth hidden in the rugged foothills of the Kolyma region. As it should be. As it should be. 20 and 1? Well, could be worse. How is the administrative strain on the budget? Oh, nice. We're going to keep going on quickly, 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 quickly. Poverty's getting better. Army professionalism is doing very well as well. We can be proud of that. Mines. Um, let's take a look. It is July 1st. Redoubts, failed uh, Blackshirt Divisions, Stronghold. I'm not seeing it. Maybe we got, got rid of it. That's good. Reopen Col Colima. In the ghetto. Grigory was roused from his nap by a commotion outside his window at first. So distant that he thought it was part of a dream. The cacophony of voices marching uh, of, and disorderly marching grew ever louder. He could bear it no more and rose from his armchairs with a creak of old bones, ripping open the curtains from his apartment's soul window. He saw what was unfolding down on the street. A crowd of maybe a hundred people were shuffling their way down the street. Some looked far worse than others. A few dragged large suitcases behind them, but most of them had nothing save the clothes on their backs. Gregory was puzzled for a moment. Then he saw the rifle toting black shirts at the flank, and the pieces fell into place. As the crowd moved on towards the walled ghetto that had been erected over the past several weeks, Gregory sighed and returned to his seat, putting the Tsar reset behind him. The last time he had seen persecution in action, it had been in the name of the Tsar. Now it was in the name of some vase, an ideology dreamed up by a mad German. No matter how far Gregory fled, no matter how far he tried, or how many Jews he offered shelter, it seemed that Russia would never change. He could do not but weep. And train if you must. And we'll finish this episode with glory to Russia. God, nation, and labor, those are the three things that our party fights for. And these are the three things that will make Russia great again. The steps that we've taken here. The intense saturation of fascism within our society. The reformation of the party, RFP's party structure. The beginning of the destruction of our enemies. These things have taken us a few steps closer to realizing a complete all-Russian government. Clearly, we're headed for great things under the leadership of the Vaz of the Russians. In every house, portraits of, the, of, of Radzewski remind the people of his greatness. Only under him will we be able to regain Russia's gloss glory and purge our nation of the enemies who have wronged us. So glory to Russia, glory to God, glory to the Russian fascist party, and finally, always glory to our Vaz, Konstantin Vladimirovich Radzewski. Very good. Reopening cold mouth. Bring yourselves to order, the commandment shouted. Over the wind, dozens of gaunt, contemptible faces stood before him, all enemies of the state. The civil slog had no shortage of workers since the triumph of the Vazd. NKVD Komisars stood next to the aged monarchists who had fought for a false star, and Siberian fanatics chattered their teeth along Matkovsky's kosher fa fascists. Your leaders have led you down a path lighted by the deceitful lanterns of the Zionists. Your causes have been hung up upon the gallows of righteousness. Your leaders have been apprehended in their attempt to undermine the Russian people. The corpses are food for the worms, as are most of their most ardent supporters. He remembered the cold inflicted upon him here. A distant memory before the collapse. Hours in the gold mines are breaking ground for our, the highway that made him a strong representative of the ideal Russian. Now the burden had fallen upon his shoulders to transform those failed men into something useful. Some had once served the Vaz loyally until it was discovered they had plotted against him in the secret. Now, their tattered rags made a poor defense against Siberian winds. The agents of Jewry would tell you this is a punishment, even a crime to treat you as you were to treat you as we do. But that is yet another other lies meant to keep you weak at their mercy, to overcome adversity with the whole world against you. That is what it means to be a man of Russia. You have a debt to your people and you are paid off here, in sweat and toil. Only when that debt is paid, your crimes against the Baz will be forgiven. So work with all your might that you might someday receive his forgiveness. Your work shall set you free. Actually, you know, let's keep doing some, some more of this stuff here. The Heart of Russia. 
The Russian people took naturally to the strains and boons of the Industrial Revolution like a moth to a flame. It's painfully, plainly obvious to anyone that the Russian is an inherently adaptable individual who is best suited, not just for the romanticized way of life of the rural peasant, but also for work in our vast industrial complexes, turning out industrial goods and weapons of war. The beating heart of Russia has, since its earliest days of industrialization, its economic and industrial might. During the Russian Revolution, the Bolsheviks and the Bukharin took over, reducing the basic Russian instinct to work for to a pathetic appeal towards an international worker for their nation. And when their perfidious union collapsed, the subsequent economic fall shattered Russia's industry. It's time to finally rebuild. And rebuild we must. Oh, we can keep playing for a little bit more. Why not? The heart of Russia. Good. No more strains. Build, build, build. The age of rebuilding has descended upon us. Uh, you know, I'll leave it up to you guys. Should we do quality and quantity and get more population and more men, more guns? Or should we do look to the future and get tanks? Because I'm not opposed to making tanks. We might use them, we might not. So I'll leave that up to you guys. Up next, lessons from Europe. Yes, please. While the once great German Empire now struggles in the West, the Russian ruination wasn't caused by their economy. Their economy, a sector dominated by mega corporations and the use of less than willing dissidents, the latter of which we have an uncountable amount, earned them the role of paramount economic power in Europe. Better still, the corporate system that Rozdevsky plans to borrow from the Germans was one that won the one that won them the Second World War and earned them their spot in the powers of today. They shattered the decrepit union with Germany's economic might and sealed their fate during the West Russian War, due to almost entirely to their unwavering fascist spirit and their sound economic system. By encouraging the formation of Russian mega corporations and extending the forced labor systems that we already have in place, we can take some lessons from Europe and implement it for the Russia of tomorrow. Very good. Get some more engineers. It doesn't matter what we need. We need engineers to help dig in, dig in, dig in, dig in, dig in. You guys are okay. We don't really need you. You guys have engineers, and our normal divisions have engineers as well, which is incredibly important. Incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important. Oh, we can do more stuff? Good! How much artillery do we need? 600? We can afford some more. Oh, we can't get any more, though. Okay. Good. Keep building. We need to build as fast as possible. Get more weekly manpower. I don't care. We need it. Infrastructure. How is infrastructure here? It's actually looking... Okay, it's really not that bad at all. Heart of Russia, good. Lessons from Europe, why not? Mm. We get more oil too, and that's actually true. oil, chromium, and tungsten. I'm not sure we really need that too much, but we'll do that anyways. There you go. And we might get more poverty. No, we already did poverty. That's good. We're looking quite good, at least on research and uh, societal development. So, class collaboration, mm, the Vaz vision, collective economic management. Hmm. Well, we gotta do this all eventually, and this is it's gonna help us out period, regardless, so. Let's do that. Spend. Class collaboration. One of the most important tenets of fascism is the promoting class cooperation. This is in contrast to the detestable practices of the communists who attempt to stoke class conflict and liquidate those who they deem to be undesirable. Instead of attempting the insurmountable, we should promote class cooperation between all, from the lowest of the low to the Vaz himself. It matters not if you are a rural peasant struggling with literacy or an industrial magnate whose heating in his home reminds him of his time spent in Habin. All should be working towards a single goal, the goal of cooperating with one another and bridging the gap between the socio-economic divides. The Tsarists ignored the divides, and the Soviets failed in trying to eliminate the divides by killing other classes. Clearly, the only way forward is to ensure seamless cooperation amongst the classes. The only true way forward. They're at war. Soviet. We don't care about the English for now. Are we still mobilizing? That'd be really nice. And there goes Wales. No, we're not. That sucks. Death of Puyi, Soviet. And maybe we'll do two more. The worker. Expertise, agriculture, the farmer. Based on what territory we control at the moment, the farmer is not a sector of society that is overly numerous. But that's not to say that that won't be the future once more arable land is secured, nor should they be small in number, and that they aren't as equally as important as other members of society. The Russian man marches on Russian food, after all, and where would we be if we did not have any of the latter? We can institute generous agricultural grants and cheapen loans or cheap loans to incentivize Russians to start their own farms and encourage those who are currently struggling to pull through and continue their work. We cannot and will not allow those to our west to outpace our agricultural production based on purely on the fact that our lands are more fertile than ours. We have the spirit of the Russian farmer on our side, as it should be. The industrialist, which we'll read very soon with after we do the farmer. Good. Very, very good. 
If the workers <clears throat> are the heart of our nation and the farmers are the muscle and sinew, surely the industrious are the brains of the nation, keeping everything working in conjunction and ensuring that the people throughout society are well equipped for the economic success and taken care of. The industrious are the ones who are in charge of the well-being of our economy. Below the vase, of course, but ultimately the ones who will not only stimulate the Russian economy but drive it forward into the future. Thus, we will need to give large amounts or large government grants and legal concessions to those industrials and the firms that they represent to ensure that we have taken care of not just the body but the brain as well. While this may develop into a situation where a number of Russian mega corporations develop a strong hold on our economy, as these corporations who once propelled Germany into superpowerdom, and will do so again with Holy Russia. Good. Don't mourn. Organize. It wasn't often that one saw a strike in the all-Russian government. Many thought bought the Vaz promises of class collaboration and fair representation for all true Russians. Others were simply content to have security and income, even if the hours were demanding and the conditions harsh. The Free Union of Eastern Far Eastern Workers, illegally formed by 80 arms worker factory workers, in the wake of the comrade being shot for failing to meet quota, was not numbered among them. They marched through the streets, the morning sun rising before them. Some citizens leaned out of windows to cheer them on in defiance of the regime. A few, finding their courage, rallied to the red bedsheets held aloft on the stake that served as a banner. When the crowd arrived at the town hall, now bathed in the warmth of the sun, it had swollen to over 200 individuals, buoyed aloft by a group euphoria, chanting and singing for the liberation of workers and against all odds. They didn't see the armed blackshirts stalking them throughout alleyways. They didn't hear the distinctive clack of Maxim guns being charged in windows all around them. What they did notice, as the street suddenly began to fill with the dead and dying, was the sudden heat and pain of a leaden storm tearing into the strikers and snuffing out their hope like a fading candle. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet. But if you enjoyed the video, please do consider leaving a like. It helps me out. Uh, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow, as we will go to war with the Central Siberian Republic and probably struggle with them greatly. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.